Do y'all know what we're doing today? No. no. You're making me a cable. <laughs> I'm teaching my daughters how to make an ethernet cable. I think everyone should know how to do this, right? Don't throw that thing at me. It should be required learning in schools. And if you're getting into IT or getting your CCNA, this is a rite of passage. Don't skip this. So in this video, my girls are going to make an ethernet cable and you're going to as well. Or at least I'll show you how to do it. We're gonna walk through every step of how to make an ethernet cable. I found grandma hair. <laughs> and do a fun little project to help us remember how to make one. But we're not gonna stop there. You see, ethernet cables are amazing, the way they work. And we're gonna explore that. We're gonna cut it open and see, hey, man, how do these things work? Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> so you ready? Let's do this. And if you're studying for your CCNA, this covers exam objective 1.3. And thank you to the sponsor of this video and the CCNA series, Boson Software. Boson by far makes the best learning resources for the CCNA, CCMP. So whether you want uh, labs, a practice exam, courseware, they got you covered, link below. And also at the end of the video, I'll have a few questions from their practice exam. I can never say that right. Practice exam, there we go. And we'll see if you know the contents of this video. Anyways, let's go. Now we'll start with this. Why do we even need to make Ethernet cables? Because they, they come like this. Like you can buy these at the store and that's the recommended way. Why do we have to make them? I mean, this is a fresh cable. Let me unwrap it right now. Well, sometimes you might have people come up and just cut your Ethernet head off. Please be careful. Ah! <laughs> Happens all the time. And then you cut it again. No, no, get out of here. Oh. Yeah, give me those scissors. No, <laughs> you're not cutting. <laughs> Now, seriously, there are legit reasons to make your own ethernet cable. I mean, this would be a legit reason, but still doesn't happen very often unless you have kids in your house like me. But most of the time, when you make your own ethernet cable, you're either running cable in your home or in your business for your company, and you need custom lengths. Like this right here is a five foot ethernet cable. You, you can find 10 feet, 100 feet, 50 feet, like whatever. But sometimes you need custom lengths. And that's where making your own cable is the most economical way to do that. So here's what I want you to do real quick. Do it with me. Go find the ethernet cable plug into your modem or your computer or whatever, the thing that gives you internet. Take it like this, find a pair of scissors and do that. <laughs> because now you are forced to learn how to make your own cable. Now, seriously, don't do that unless you have the supplies to make your own cable. Speaking of which, what do you need to make your own cable? Here we go. Now, of course, the first thing we'll need is some ethernet cable. I'm gonna be rocking some Cat5e UTP cable. This is what I would recommend. It's the most common cable you'll find out there. So at minimum, Cat5e. The next thing you'll need is a crimper. This tool will help us cut our cable and crimp down the ethernet heads. And speaking of which, we'll need some ethernet heads. Some good old RJ45 ethernet heads. You can pick all these up at Amazon, Home Depot, wherever. Now this is completely optional, but having a good ethernet cable tester will save you some serious headaches. They're not too expensive and they are worth it. And I'll show you how to use it too. They're pretty fun. And then finally, things that are not optional at all. First, you're gonna want some coffee. Let's go ahead and make some right now. And the second thing that's totally not optional is you'll need a couple of kids to do all the work for you. So now with our supplies, our coffee, and my two kids, let's get going. Now I do wanna clear this up real quick. When people say, hey, I want you to make an ethernet cable, what they really mean is they want you to put new ethernet heads on the ends, which you might go, well, that's, that's pretty easy, right? No, I mean, it can be once you do it a few times, but it does take a bit of practice, but it's not too bad. I'll walk you through it right now. So step one, take your cable. Should look something like this. If it still has a head on them, then, ah. Cut off his head. I'm gonna do a clean cut just for fun here. There we go. Nice and clean. Guillotine it. Guillotine. <laughs> off with her head. Hard. Here. Ooh, okay, here. We'll do it together, okay? Okay. Ready? We'll cut right here. Ready? Go. <laughs> Bam. Now look inside there. What do you see? <gasps> I see blue, white. You can see those wires sticking their heads out, ready to come out. So let's make them come out. Step one is that we want to remove about half an inch of the sheath from this cable. 
And when I say sheath, I mean just the, the jacket, the covering, covering those internal wires. A half an inch is fine. Um, an inch is also fine if you are doing it for your first time. It'll be helpful. So here's what we're gonna do. Notice on my crimping tool, I've got two cutting options. One for off with her head situations, my guillotine. The other, I have a little slot with the blade right above it, perfect for an ethernet cable just to slide right in there. So I'm gonna slide that in right up to the point where I wanna cut it, but I'm not going to cut it. Calm down, don't do that. <laughs> All you want to do at this point is kind of scratch the sheath a little. The technical term is scoring it, but all you really want to do is just barely scratch it because you don't want to hurt the metal cables of the copper wires inside. And if you look at my cable, just a few scratches, no big deal, and that's what you want. So now with our scratches there, we're going to start bending it. Notice how when I bend it, bam, it's exposed. It's happening. It's easy. back and forth until, until it's gone, until you can pull off his pants. That's what my, my daughter's called it. <laughs> and once you have that broken, you can pull off the pants completely. Ooh. There we go. Now, isn't that gorgeous? Well, first of all, let me get the grandma hair out of there. That's also what my daughter's called it. I found grandma hair. <laughs> we have four twisted pairs of wires, eight colorful wires. They're amazing. They're beautiful. They're magical. Why? <laughs> Because think about it, these wires right here, they're how you're watching this video right now. Literally electrical signals are going across this wire or wires like this, and that's how you're watching me. That's amazing. But how does it do that? How does it work? Let's talk about it. I'm gonna take a moment here and dive in, get geeky, get nerdy, and talk about how ethernet cables actually work, where they came from. Now, if all you care about right now is making a cable, that's fine, I've got timestamps, go ahead and skip ahead. But right now, we're gonna dive deep. How does this sucker work? Let's talk about it. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is make this cable naked. For science, of course. Um, I'm going to take off the rest of the sheath or the Ethernet cable jacket. Just going to scar the rest of the uh, stuff here and try to get it off. Now, if you really truly want to make a cable, don't do this. <laughs> the sheath is there for a reason. Ah, there it is. The cable in all its glory. Let's get the grandma hair out of there. Look at it. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> if you've never done this before, then go ahead and do it right now. You should. Now, of course, the reason we have the sheath or the jacket is to protect our cable. Keep him nice, safe, and secure in his little jacket. But it doesn't protect him from everything. You see, Ethernet cables do have enemies, an arch enemy, called EMI, or electromagnetic interference. Any other device that has swiftly changing electrical current emits EMI. Now, that can be and is a lot of stuff in your house or your business. This jacket over here does little to protect from it, but not all is lost. You see, notice our wires. <laughs> They're not just like sitting still chilling, right? They're twisted together, which might be a little strange. Like, why, why are they twisted together? <laughs> why are they doing that? EMI. Twisting those wires together actually helps protect against EMI. And notice they're twisted into pairs. And EMI is not the only enemy to the Ethernet cable. The other enemy would be crosstalk. Electrical signals are going across these wires, and if they weren't twisted, if they were just running parallel to each other, there'd be a lot of crosstalk and interference. But by twisting them together, we can actually avoid that for the most part. So because this cable is unshielded, he only has a jacket on, and he's twisted, he has twisted pairs, we call him a UTP cable, which stands for unshielded twisted pair. Now this cable does have a stronger older brother named STP, or shielded twisted pair. And he's not just wearing a jacket, he's got another layer, another legit shield that protects from EMI. Now he's used in like very serious circumstances like factories and places where there's a ton of EMI. So for the most part, if you're just using your cables in your business or your home, um, that's when you're gonna see mostly UTP cable, unshielded twisted pair. Now before we untwist these wires, one thing to note, the jacket that he's wearing, they come in different types. Like this one right here, it's an okay jacket, great to run in your house. But if I were to run this into like maybe a ceiling or a place where there might be a fire hazard, you don't want to use this type of cable. If it were to burn, it does emit toxic chemicals. So there are other types of cables with a different type of jacket, plenum cables, that are designed to be run in those very specific situations. So enough about the jacket, let's get that out of here. We don't care about that. Let's untwist the cables and talk about what's actually happening under the hood inside our cables. I mean, he's already naked, right? Let's uh, untwist the pairs here. It's actually a pretty huge pain to do this. Come on, oh, there we go. That works, yeah. Okay, now we have our untwisted pairs. I gave them a bit of a haircut so we can see them better. Now, what's going on with these? I mean, this is the guts of our ethernet cable. What's actually happening under the hood or inside the jacket? I guess jackets have hoods. I don't know, let's keep going. So these are copper wires. 
copper because it's really great at conducting electricity, right? And that's what's going to be flying through these. Coffee break. Now also notice there are eight total wires and they're paired up. We've got the orange brothers, orange and white orange. The blues brothers, uh, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> white, blue, and blue. The green brothers and the brown brothers. Four total pairs and normally they are twisted together, right? These eight copper wires make up a cable we know and love. It's our category 5E cable or cat 5E for short. His official name is the 1000 base T cable. And this cable is awesome. I mean, he's fast. He goes at gigabit speeds. But before we talk about how he runs, how he works, I feel like I need to go back in time a bit to truly appreciate how far we've come and to understand why it's so cool what we have now. I mean, really, it truly is. So to do that, we're going to have to actually take away a few of these copper wires. You'll understand why I'm doing that here in a moment. But right now we have eight, and that helps us go freaking fast. But once upon a time, We were four shy, down by half. This type of cable with only four measly wires was what we had for a long time. <laughs> and it, in those days, it was fast. Like back in my day, this is what we had. Let's talk about it. Yes, we're still dealing with copper wires, but we only have four now, two pairs. And the first standard we're gonna look at circa 1990, one year after I was born, 10 base T. Blazing fast for its day, the 10 indicates the speed of the cable. 10 megabits per second. The T stands for twisted pair which would also indicate that it's going to be using copper, copper wires. Now the copper wires in this cable were kind of old. We call these cat three wires or category three. And that's one thing people don't know. When we say cat five or cat five E or cat six, we're not referring to the entire ethernet cable. We're referring to the individual wires, the copper wires. So in the 10 base T cable, cat three wires, four total wires, giving us a blazing 10 megabits per second speed. And then as we go forward in time, a few standards later, 1995, good year. Toy Story, right? I think, yeah. In comes 100 base T, and actually TX to be precise. Now, how fast does this go? Well, if you're paying attention, it's right here. It goes 100 megabits per second, which for its time was like, what? And I can't write while I'm looking at the camera. That's crazy. And again, the T standing for twisted pair, and that means copper. Now, I'm pointing that out because you'll often see other notations like LX or S, and that will actually mean fiber. But that's a topic for another time. Now this cable often goes by a different name as well. This is fast ethernet cable. When we refer to anything that uses 100 megabits per second, we always say, oh yeah, that's a fast ethernet port. That's a fast ethernet cable. And it was fast ethernet for the time. Now what made it faster than 10 base T? Well, it wasn't the number of wires. We still had four wires, but it was the type of wires we used. We went from cat three to cat five. Now let's get a bit more nerdy. Both of these cables worked in a similar way. Now again, these copper wires have electricity flowing through them which is why they're in pairs. Each one of these is a closed loop, an electrical circuit, allowing electricity to flow. Now this is cool, but you might be wondering, okay, fine, the wires are a pair, they form an electrical circuit, but how is that sending me my YouTube video? How is this working right now? Watch this, let me get this other stuff out of the way and we'll talk about it. Now I am gonna oversimplify things here a bit, but you know that computers talk to each other in binary, right? Ones and zeros, and I'm not saying anything right now, so I'm just, <laughs> I'm just writing, right? and the computer will take those ones and zeros and turn it into this YouTube video you're watching right now. But how does an electrical signal communicate a bunch of ones and zeros? Like this, watch this. And I stole this example from this article I read on this and it's just fantastic. If you wanna dive deeper than what I'm doing right now, read this article, link below. Let's say that we want a binary one communicated across the ethernet cable, these wires. To do that, they'll simply change the voltage that they're sending across the wire. So for example, the electrical current's flowing on this cable, right? Or these wires. Let's say it sends 2.5 volts down the wire. The other end will go, oh, okay, <laughs> that's a one. It's kind of like shock therapy. And let's say they wanted to send a zero down the wire, a binary zero. Well, they would maybe send a negative 2.5 volts down the wire. Oh, not as bad, <laughs> that's a zero. Now again, this is way, way oversimplified. This happens a million times with varying voltages and encoding schemes, but that's basically the big idea. Changing the voltages in the electrical current to communicate data. That's amazing. <laughs> if, you're, if you feel that's amazing, then why are you even here? Anyways, now let's step back a bit and start talking again about 10 base T and 100 base T X. With these standards, let me write them up here again. One pair of wires was used to send data, which we often see abbreviated as TX. Has nothing to do with the TX up here, so ignore that. It stands for transmit. And the other pair of wires was dedicated to receiving, or RC. Now this is crazy important to know. I'll show you why here in a second. And it's also the reason we color code our wires. Let me show you why. I'm going to introduce a new character into the story here. Mr. RJ45. Everyone say hello. 
<laughs> this is our RJ45 Ethernet header. It's what we'll plug these wires into. It's the end. It's what we terminate them to. Let me give each side one. I mean, I don't have to tell you too much about these. You know these, you love these, you love the sound it makes when you plug them into a switch. Oh yeah, they're great. But just a few things. Inside this Ethernet head, this RJ45 jack, are eight pinouts. Eight places for a wire to be inserted into. And notice in these pinouts, there's a bit of metal, so it actually can conduct the electricity and send that those bits and data streams into your computer. But now we're getting to the interesting part, the fun part, where we actually have to know how to build a cable, how we structure a cable, and if we don't, then it ain't gonna work. So I'm gonna draw an Ethernet head pin out over here. Again, there are eight pin positions, eight pins. I'm gonna get this stuff out of the way too, just for the time being. Now let's talk about a Raspberry Pi. I love talking about Raspberry Pis, but what does it have to do with this? Well, like most PCs and end devices, it has built into it an Ethernet NIC, or an Ethernet Network Interface Card. Like right here, it has an, a port to plug in an RJ45 cable. I mean, that's not news to you, right? Your laptop, your computer has these, or maybe not your laptop anymore, but definitely your computers, your desktops. Now here's the important part. This Raspberry Pi and all computers and things like it, all end devices, its network interface card is programmed to send data on pins one and two. So every time it attempts to send anything, it sends it down pins one and two. And then when it wants to receive something, it'll receive things on pins three and not four, <laughs> like you might think, six, three and six. Let me label those real quick, transmit and receive. So it's at this point where it becomes very, very important how we put our copper wires inside this Ethernet header. So let me insert these into our little diagram here. Got to use some tweezers for this. This is very delicate work here. I'm going to slide my pins into the diagram here, or my wires into the diagram here. White, orange into pin one, orange into pin two, white, blue in pin three. This will be our receiving pin, or our receiving wires, and blue into pin six. Now, if Mr. Pi here is sending something on these wires, well, he's sending it to somebody, right? Like there's got to be something on the other end. And there is. So let's add my other Ethernet header here at the other side. And most often, what's on the other side of an endpoint? What do we plug things into? A switch. Yep, you got it. It's a switch. Let's draw that real quick. A switch with lots of Ethernet ports. Now, it might appear at first that we have a problem here because the Ethernet NIC in the Raspberry Pi is sending data on pins 1 and 2. Does the switch also send data on pins one and two? Because I thought if that were the case, like there'd be a traffic jam, blah. No, that's not the case. These switches, because they are normally being connected to end devices, endpoints, they change it up. Switches will receive data on pins one and two, and you probably guessed it, they'll send data on pins three and six to match up. So they'll send data on pins three and six, and guess what? The host receives data on pins three and six. Perfect. That's how the pins are programmed in the switch, and that's how the pins are programmed in the Ethernet NIC on the Raspberry Pi. Now this right here, the way we've arranged our copper wires inside our pins, our pinouts, this is called a straight through design, or you might hear it called a straight through cable. It is by far the most common cable you'll see. It's the one we're making in this video, and it makes sense. Like we connect our endpoints, our PCs to switches, and that calls for having the copper wires to be in the same positions on each side. One to one, two to two, three to three, six to six. But let me kick you a scenario real quick. And actually, as I'm saying that, I'm realizing I did something wrong here. If you want to properly make a 10 base T or a 100 base T X, I'm going to X back in there. If you want to properly make one of those cables, you got to have the colors right. The way we put our colors in order is extremely important. Right now I'm rocking white, orange, orange, white, blue, blue. Orange is fine, but the blue does not match up. I want to take blue out. I want you to be able to walk away from this video and confidently say, yes, I can make a 10 base T cable, if anything. <laughs> so commonly we're going to be using green in our 10 base T and 100 base T X cables. So let me scoot those guys in there. It's going to be white green at pen position three and green at pen position six. Good enough. But now here's my scenario. What if, and this does happen, what if the other end was not a switch? What if the device we wanted to connect our Raspberry Pi to was instead of a switch, another Raspberry Pi? Let me scoot that in here real quick. There he is. Now, just so we're not confused, I'm going to name these guys. This is going to be uh, George Pi. Hi, George and Harry Pie. Now I said interesting scenario. It's more of actually a problem. You see right now, the way we have things connected, do you think they're going to work? No, no, they're not going to work. And let me tell you why. When George wants to send Harry something, what's he going to do? Was well, he going to send some bits, some voltages down pens one and two? Yeah, we know that. 
But when Harry wants to send George something, what's he going to do? Well, he's going to send things down pins one and two. And then, blah, things blow up because it doesn't work, right? George isn't listening on pins one and two, and neither is Harry. They're both talking, and no one's listening. It's like my kids when they're fighting. And then they're both listening on pens 3 and 6, but nothing's happening over there. Nothing's talking. They're just sitting there silently in a room. Nothing's going on. So if you've ever connected a straight-through cable between two like devices, like a PC, two PCs connected together, two Raspberry Pis, it didn't work, did it? At least with a fast Ethernet cable, 10 base T and 100 base TX. Now, not all is lost. There is a solution, and it's actually pretty easy. Check this out. All we have to do is simply cross over some cables. I'm going to screw the green guys out of the way for a second. Ah, I just messed them up. Daggum it. <laughs> This is really hard with tweezers and stuff. I'm never doing this again. So I'm going to leave the white, orange, and orange wires in pen one and two on George's Pi here, on his pinout. But instead of pin one going to pin one, I'm going to have pin one go to pin three. And then pin two will go to, what do you think? Pin six. That way, when George is talking to Harry, He's not talking to his mouth. He's talking to his ears, which I know is a weird thing to say, but that's what's happening here. He's talking to where he's listening. And we'll do the same thing for Harry. We're going to take his pen one and go to George's pen three. That's our, that's our white green cable. And we'll take the green one going from Harry's pen two to George's pen six. Good enough. <laughs> Just pretend it's reaching all the way to pen six. So now they're both talking to each other's ears. And we've successfully crossed over the wires. In fact, that's what this type of cable is called. We call this a crossover cable. And again, this is required when you want to connect devices that are similar. So PC to PC, Raspberry Pi to Raspberry Pi, switch to switch. Yeah, at least you used to with fast ethernet. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. There's something special they do. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living in the past here. Let's stop talking about the old stuff. Let's talk about the new fast stuff, the stuff we have now, the cable we're making in this video, the Cat 5e, the thousand base T. <laughs> Let's get them in here. Things are about to heat up because we know that we're not dealing with just four wires. We're going to be dealing with eight copper wires. And I'm sure you're curious, what's that look like? Let's talk about it. Let me get Harry out of here. And let's put our switch back in there as well because I do want to focus on the straight through cable first. Now I'm going to wire up my cable back to a straight through real quick. I'm going to uncross my wires. Puts a whole new perspective on the saying, you got my wires crossed. <laughs> just thought about that. In some cases, it is a good thing. So now with 1000 base T, our gigabit ethernet cable, Cat 5e. We know we have eight copper wires. Let's bring in our other players real quick. Come on in brown and blue. But where do they go? How do we arrange these guys? Well, I got a simple way to um, help you with that. <laughs> Paint your nails. You'll memorize it real quick. Trust me. Now notice the order I have the wires in for 10 base T and 100 base TX. It does still match my, my fingernails, even though we're using four wires. White, orange, orange, white, green, and then green on my thumb. The other fingers tell us where to put the rest of the wires for 1000 base T. Let's do that. Right after white green, we're going to have blue come in. And then right after blue, we're going to have white blue. Come on, guy. And then lastly, we'll have our brown come in. White brown will come in first, right after green at pen position 7. And finally, brown at 8. And boom, right here, this is a Cat 5e straight through cable pin out. Just like this. We know it's straight through because the pins match on each side. We even have a name for the way these wires are arranged. It's called the 568B pinout. Now, I want to tell you something kind of amazing. Are you ready? Watch this. We know that pins 1 and 2 are used to send traffic on an Ethernet NIC, so TX. And then pins 3 and 6 are used to receive, RC. But what about these new guys, 4 and 5 and 7 and 8? What do they do? Well, the amazing thing is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? The cool thing about Gigabit Ethernet, 1000 base T, Cat 5V cables, is that they can send and receive data simultaneously. Did I say that right? Simultaneously, yes, on each pair of wires. That means pins one and two can both send and receive at the same time. So we can just call him TXRC. And I just realized I've been using RC like it's actually a thing. It's not. <laughs> we typically use RX as a receiving. I guess just thought receive, the C in there, whatever. We do use RX in the networking world to refer to receiving. But anyways. <laughs> That's amazing, right? So it doesn't matter. Each pair of wires can simultaneously send and receive traffic. That's part of the reason why we can get these crazy fast gigabit speeds. Now, if we had to say what 4 and 5 do, those are transmit, and 7 and 8 are receive. But again, with the new standard we have now, it doesn't matter which one transmits receives, they both do both at the same time. But, but I'll say this, it does still matter what order we put our wires in. 
when we create our cables. If you're making a straight through cable, you want to make sure that both sides are matching 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, 4 to 4, and you put your colors in the right order, match a pin out. Most common one we have now is 568B. Now I'm going to bring in our old friend Harry once more. Again, what if we have Raspberry Pi to Raspberry Pi, PC to PC? Again, we need to cross over the cables, right, to make that work. But how do we do that with eight cables? The answer is the same way. It's actually, yeah, it is the same way. We'll cross over the same wires. So I'll do that real quick, and it's going to take me a second because it's, this is hard. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, it's a little messy. I'll put up a real diagram right now, but you got the gist, right? We cross over wires one and two, three and six. This pinout actually has its own name. We call this the 568A pinout. So if you're looking up, hey, how do I make a crossover cable? We'll make one side 568B and the other side 568A. Straight through, make both sides 568B, or you could actually make both sides 568A, but more commonly we still see now 568B on both sides, straight through. That's what we'll be doing here in a moment. Now, what if I told you I kind of wasted your time telling you about crossover cables with um, <laughs> 1000 base T? Because I basically did. According to the Gigabit Ethernet standard, Crossover cables are basically not needed. And it's, again, it's magic. It's kind of magic. Watch this. I'm going to put these guys back into a straight through design. I'm going to take George and Harry out of here for a moment because I want to focus in real quick on two switches. When we connect two switches together, which we do often in the networking world, in theory, you would need a crossover cable because they send and receive on the same pens. However, switches are lit. They're smart. They're amazing. We've talked about this before. And they have this feature called Auto MDIX. And what this basically means is they'll use magic, or technology rather, to detect what pens are being received and sent on. And they'll simply just change what pens they send and receive on to match the person plugged in. So if you plug your PC into a switch, it'll receive on one and two, send on three and six. But if you plug a switch into a switch, he'll change it up. He'll send on one and two and receive on three and six. Switches have had this feature for a while, even with 100 base TX. But now as part of the 1000 base T standard, to be considered a gigabit ethernet NIC, everyone does this. Now, I don't want to get crap for this. This is not the proper way to write this out. I'm gonna, I want to write it out properly, just so I avoid the trolls here. It's auto MDI-X, right? That's how, you, that's how you do it? Okay, fine. Now, officially for any exam, if they ask you, hey, if you connect two switches together, what kind of cable is required? You want to answer crossover. They're testing you on your cable knowledge. But in reality, now with our 1000 base T cables, and what Switch has been doing for a while, it doesn't matter. They will automatically change what pens they send and receive on, avoiding the issue altogether. Isn't that magic? I freaking love that. But you wouldn't appreciate that unless you knew where we came from, unless you knew what we had to deal with before. My children will never have to make a crossover cable unless I force them to, which I probably will. Now our 1000 base T cable, man, he doesn't quit. He's fast, gigabit ethernet. He only has one limitation, only one. I know, right? It's how long you can make the cable. He can only go 100 meters which is a good length. But if you try to make a cable longer than that, which you can, like you can do it, if you try to go longer, it won't work. <laughs> it just won't. This cable has a limitation where the electrical signal is going across. If they go past 100 meters, it'll start to degrade. And that basically means crappy internet. It won't work very well. As you're going further in the CCNA and you'll learn more about things, this will cause what's called late collisions. And this goes for 10 base T and 100 base TX. Don't make your cables longer than 100 meters. If you want longer than that, you're going to want to go for something else like maybe fiber, which we'll talk about later. Now let's talk about the future because the future is now. We do have some cool new stuff like Cat6 and Cat8. Let's talk about that. Now officially Cat6, which again is referring to the wires inside of your Ethernet cable, it's just a more reliable version of Cat5e. But people, when they talk about Cat6 and the crazy speeds you can get from it, are mainly talking about Cat6a. Cat6a is exciting and crazy. We call this 10G base T. And if you remember why we name things the way we do, you got really excited because 10G means 10 gigabits per second. Oh. Like that's crazy. Like that that's not even fair. <laughs> that's Cat 6A. And again, it's still using the same eight wires. Well, not the same. Like they're Cat 6A wires, but it's still only eight wires. And it does look different. Like it has like a weird thing in the middle. Like look at this picture here. But it's freaking awesome. And even more futuristic is Cat 8. <laughs> Cat 8. We call this 40G base T. And yeah, I mean, by now you know what I'm talking about. That's just crazy. 40 gigs. 40 gigabits per second. Who needs that? I do. I need that. I want that. Okay, let's continue making our cable. So the first thing I want to do, you see this grandma hair right here? 
<laughs> Let's just get her out of the way right now. It's kind of annoying. I'm just going to grab some regular scissors because, you know, regular scissors are the best things for regular hair. And let's go ahead and cut that out of here. Ah. Got it. <laughs> and now we're going to take our twisted pairs and we're going to untwist them. So untwist each pair of cables. Kind of a pain, but not too bad. Now, once they're untwisted, what you also want to do is kind of iron them out. Make them very, very straight. It's going to make your job a lot easier here in a moment. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Kind of fan them out a bit and make them super straight. Now, what order we put these colored wires in is very important. If you don't put them in the right order, then your cable just won't work. So what order do they need to go in? Well, um, got a little reference <laughs> table for you here. <laughs> this is the best way to memorize this. Just uh, paint your nails. <laughs> Easy enough. Time to paint some nails. Thank you think you. with five girls I would have done this before. The nails? Sorry. There's only eight strands of copper in an Ethernet cable. Daddy! <laughs> so I'm gonna paint that. Alright, time to get my nails painted. <laughs> Is good. Okay. <laughs> it's done! It looks like poop. Yeah, it's brown. <laughs> Again, this is the 568B pinout. That's what we're going to use for our straight through cable here. So let's go ahead and do that. So first we'll start with white orange. Get that kind of massaged and ironed with my finger right there. Then orange. He's right there already. Ready to go. Team player. Next we'll have white green and I'll go ahead and scoot that guy over here. Now it's important as you're doing this, you want to make sure that they're lined up from the bottom to the top because we're actually going to end up cutting more towards the bottom here. So make sure you have it kind of tightened with your thumb there as you place each cable or wire. I keep calling them cables. They're wires. Now I had to double check and look closely that that was green because I'm colorblind. And <laughs> as you can imagine, making cables has always been terrible for me. Anybody else out there colorblind? Anyways, let's keep going. Tell me if I'm doing it wrong, please. Now this is where things get weird. You might think green will come after white green. No, not here, not today. After white green, we're gonna have blue sneak in. Let's try to make things as straight as possible. And again, I'm just gonna kind of iron it out to make sure they stay in place. And then after blue, we go back to following the rules. White blue comes in. Let's get green out of the way there. White blue settles right in next to blue. Again, making sure it's nice and straight from the bottom to the top. My daughters actually did not make sure that was the case and um, they messed up. I'll show you here in a moment. Now after white, blue, green finally gets to come in and join the team. So make sure he's nestled safely there. And then finally we got brown. So we're gonna pull in white, brown first. Come on around brown. And then white next, <laughs> white next, right next to white, brown, we're gonna have brown come in as our final wire. At this point, I'm gonna hold them very, very tightly with my right thumb here. My green thumb, hey, I've got a green thumb. And I'm going to iron them out to where they're, whoo, not gonna move at all. And they should look like this. Are they in order? Tell me. Actually, they weren't. <laughs> blue had, white blue had snuck in. So I gotta fix it. See, attention to detail is important when making cables. So here we go. Let's inspect closely again. Are we good? I think this time around we are. So now we're ready to trim this up a bit. We're going to give it a haircut. Now my goal is to cut around right here, about half an inch I would say. So I'm going to grab my crimpers while holding this very tight and I'm going to give them a nice even buzz cut. These are hard, 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 hard. How do you do it so <laughs> Go patty. <laughs> and your buzz cut should look something like this. Beautiful. Now don't touch it. You don't want the wires to move. Leave them there. We're going to grab our RJ45 Ethernet header. And now it's time to slide those wires into their pin position. Now when you slide them in, the clip on the Ethernet header needs to be down like this. So not up, and with that sucker down, pointing down. So with white orange on the left and brown on the very far right, we're going to slide these in, praying that they all slide into the right position. Slide around there, you'll feel them kind of hit there. Yep, there we go. Now this is your chance to do a last minute spot check and look through, barely, you can barely see, right? Look through this and make sure the colors are lined up before we crimp it down. 
Now, hang on to this tightly. Don't let go yet because it's going to fall out. We want to use our crimpers now to crimp this down, make them stay. Now, notice this real quick. Part of the sheath is inside the Ethernet header, and that's a good thing. We want that because it'll actually be clamped down through this hole right here. The, the crimper will actually do that. So let's make it happen. So I have my crimper here. Yours might be a bit different, but on mine, notice I have two sides. On this side, notice there's no teeth right here. This is the side I'm actually going to put my header through. On the other side, notice there are some teeth. That's what's going to clamp down those copper wires. So let's go ahead and turn this back over. I'm going to carefully, now very carefully, slide this sucker through. Uh, I'm going to slide it up to the point where that little metal tab right there that has 8P on it, that's what's actually going to go into that slot on the Ethernet header to clamp the shield down. So you want to get it, those holes lined up, or the, the clip lined up with the hole. And then it's ready to clamp. I'm going to go ahead and turn mine around so I can show you what happens when I clamp it. You ready? I'm going to squeeze the handles together and boom, clamping. It's clamping. I'm going to do it actually a few times because I'm paranoid. Clamp, clamp, clamp. Notice that tab's going into the hole and clamping the sheath down. And now I can pull it out. So now it should be pretty snug in there. If I pull, shouldn't come off. Notice the sheath is pretty clamped. And boom, finished product. Now it's okay if yours isn't like pretty, if it doesn't look great at all, <laughs> that's fine. My first few were terrible. It took me a good hour, possibly more, just to do my first cable, so no worries. Now step two is to rinse and repeat. <laughs> do the same thing on the other side. There's two sides of the cable, right? Now, the other end. <laughs> <laughs> And because this is a straight through cable, you're going to wire it up the exact same way. You want both sides to match. So get to work. Not like any proper cooking show, I've already got one complete. <laughs> I'm not going to go make another cable. This is one I made um, yesterday, I think. Yeah, yesterday. A little small little patch cable. I love it. So now that you made your cable, does it work? Will it work well? Well, let's test it. That's what a cable tester is for. Let's grab ours right here. They're all a little bit different, but they do the same thing. So I'm going to take this off here. This is great because it's normally meant to test cables that are already run. So I could take this to an office and take this to you know a closet and see if the cable is actually working. But it works well enough right here too. So I'll plug one end to the main device here. Come on, there we go. And the other to the remote. Now notice we have the numbers one through eight. Those are all the pin positions, the cables going in there. And when I turn this on, it's going to send a little electrical signal on each wire. It'll light up one, two, three, four. Now, because this is a straight through cable, when one lights up, we want one to light up on the other side too. One, one, two, two, three, three. And if they all light up and they match, we know we're good. So let's go ahead and do this. I wanna turn it on to slow mode and fingers crossed, let's see if it works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, okay, now that's that's an example of a perfectly working straight through cable that will totally do the job. Now, my daughters tried this, um, they completed their cables, and you'll notice that the numbers don't quite match up when they do their test. That's fine, cut it up and do it again. Okay, quiz time. I'm gonna quiz you guys, and I'm gonna quiz you guys, and see if you remember how to make an Ethernet cable. Now, without looking, let me hold all my stuff and my fingernails here. Addy, actually, close, close your ears. <laughs> Addy, what order do we put our Ethernet cable in? Now look orange. at the camera over there. <laughs> Just look at the camera over there. White, orange, orange, white, green, blue, blue, white, green, white, brown, brown. Good job. All right, Chloe. Same for you. Get over here and talk in the microphone. Um, uh, what's the 568B <clears throat> pinout for any uh, Ethernet cable? It's what color or, uh, order do you put it in? White, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. Very good. All right. Um, so you passed that quiz. Now let's do the next quiz. Which colors, I'm going to hold up my fingers now, 
Here we go. Which colors, which pens send traffic? What? Which pens talk? Oh, no. Wait, I gotta, oh, I gotta uh, close my ears. Which one? Orange, dry, and orange. What, what, what's the pen number of that? One and two. One and two? Good job. All right, which ones listen? The three. Three and six, very good job. What colors are those? Green, white, blue. No, no, what, what color is three and six? Green, white, and blue. I mean, green. Good job. All right, Chloe. Which pens talk? Which colors? White, orange, and orange. One and two. One and two. All right, which pens listen? Three and six. What colors are those? White, green, I think. And? White, blue. Nope. I think it's right blue, but I don't. It's not. Three and six. Oh, green. <laughs> <laughs> Very good job. Did you guys get that right? Let me know below. And now a quiz question from Boza. Now this one might be a little difficult because it has some things we haven't exactly covered yet. But one thing we did, it was a brief mention, so let's see how you do. The question is, which of the following can cause late collisions on an Ethernet LAN? Select two choices, pause the video, go. All right, let's see how you did. Now, a lot of these things, you probably don't know what they are just yet. But hey, hold on a second. You do know what this is. Long cable segments. We talked about with an Ethernet cable, our Cat5e, the limitation was that you can only make it 100 meters in length. And if you go beyond that, if you make it longer, this can cause late collisions. <gasps> late collisions. So you know what? That might be one of the answers. Bam. Now, for everything else, you either already knew a bit of it or you had to look it up, and that's fine. Googling is the superpower of IT professionals. The answer here will be a duplex mismatch. Let's see if I got it right. Boom. And duplex mismatch has to do with one side only sending half duplex and the other sending full duplex. And we'll cover more on that later. In this video, I taught my daughters how to make a Cat5e Ethernet cable. Now, do they know everything about an Ethernet cable? No, they're still learning. That's fine, it's just a place to start. And that might be where you're at too. You may not know everything about an ethernet cable, although if you watch the entire video, you learned a lot, I'm hoping. Like how they work, electrical signals flowing across, which wires send and receive, where we came from and where we're at now, MDIX, all kinds of fun stuff. It's magic, right? But anyways, let me know below if you were able to make an ethernet cable. And you know what, if you already know how, get someone else to make it, make your kids make them. Like I said, I think everyone should at least know how to make an ethernet cable. It's fun. It's a vital part of how we live now. We need the internet, we need ethernet, it's crazy. Anyways, <laughs> I could talk about that for a long time. Um, again, huge shout out to our sponsor, Boson Software. If you wanna get your CCNA or your CCMP or Security Plus, they do a bunch of stuff. Check out their practice exams, their gold standard, their, their labs, their courseware, all of that, links below. I use them all the time, especially for right now for my CCMP as I'm studying for that. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, all the youtube -y stuff to make sure that people see this video and to show that you like it. It helps support me. Anyways, that's all I got. I'll catch you guys later.